Holy Grail in uh, medieval mythology was something that everyone wanted to find, but no one actually knew how to find it. And I believe the performance on the mobile is exactly the uh, Holy Grail today. We all probably heard about that kind of statistics, that the conversion rates for our websites are the best, are related with the page loading time. So the faster our site uh, loads, the, con uh, the better is uh, the conversion rate. The opposite also holds true. So the bounce rate uh, goes up if we fail to load quickly. So being in that sweet spot over here should be our grail, should be something we should try to, uh, to achieve, should, should be something we should try to, uh, to get to. But how, to, how can we find it? How can we find that grail of our times? There are probably multiple paths to the performance because what actually performance is? Let's first think about it because the, this is a very wide topic and very wide range of uh, things can be uh, considered a performance. Perfor performance starts on the back end. So if, if our server site is slow, we have a problem on the front end because we cannot uh, fix it totally. Then um, our content reaches the network. Network is uh, obviously known as a source of performance problem. There are uh, latencies, there are uh, throughput limitations, so we need to consider that too. Only then, the content reaches the browser, the, the actual client side. So uh, then everything needs to be uh, um, processed, needs to be rendered, all the scripts need, needs to be executed. Only then we have a fully working web application. But this is not the end of the performance story. Uh, after the page is loaded and fully functional, users are expecting our animations to be smooth without any junk or any, any uh, interruptions. All the, all the interactions from the clicks, from, from whatever the user is doing, should be also immediate. So uh, this is a big part of performance too. And going further, even uh, UX might have uh, performance inside. So there are patterns, for example, optimistic UI, that uh, is useful to hide our uh, potential performance problems if we decide to show the user that our action that takes uh, place in the background actually succeeded immediately. Uh, and assume it will succeed in the future. And uh, in the worst case, we will just roll it back uh, to the UI. So this, is, this, is, this might be useful in, uh, as a uh, UX-only fix for the perceived performance. So uh, performance is a very wide topic. We are not going to cover all of it today. We are not going to cover server-side because half of this conference is about server-side, so uh, that's uh, enough, probably. Uh, and we are not going to talk about perceived performance because I have already told everything about UX uh, I was comfortable to talk about. So we will, we will, uh, we will um, focus on the three middle parts. So the talk will have three parts. It will be about network, about load and render within the browser, and about the runtime. As we go, I would like to share my story of the little website I am running called What Web Can Do Today. Anyone already heard about it? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, this is a website that is a side project of mine that is about, uh, uh, that's a showcase of the possibilities of the modern web technologies, especially focused on uh, what uh, the web platform can offer to our mobile devices in terms of integration with the operating system and uh, with the hardware that we have on our mobile phones. So uh, for the rest of you, I recommend you to see it later. It's what web can do dot today. Um, but after this talk, obviously. Uh, so as I said, this is my side, side project. I uh, created it and I'm maintaining it after my kids go to sleep, so I don't have much time to invest. Uh, and initially, I did whatever was the simplest for me. So performance was not my uh, initial goal, and I put uh, whatever was uh, the easiest and the default uh, for me, for the web application. So the performance initially was not that good. Uh, the first, when I first measured it, um, the first paint, FP is a metric called first paint, and it means that this is a moment when something actually um, is drawn on the screen. So before first paint, the page is blank. Uh, so my first, first paint for my website measured on the actual mobile device with the throttled uh, connection to uh, have a 3G, slow 3G speed. Mm, was uh, about seven seconds. And first meaningful paint, FMP is first meaningful paint. So this is a moment when something meaningful 
uh, is shown to the user, not only a header, but also something that the user can uh, have a value from. So in my case, these are the labels of the features. Uh, it was uh, below 10 seconds, so definitely there was a room for improvement. And as we go, I would like you to show what I uh, did and what were my results uh, in terms of these metrics. Okay, let's start with the network part. HTTP2. Who is already using HTTP2 in their projects? Oh, it's even worse than in statistics, because statistics say that uh, only one in four websites are using HTTP2 at the moment. Even though the uh, protocol, the, the, the second version of the protocol is already a few years old. And this is not good. This is a, a very simple, possibly simple thing that might uh, influence our uh, performance just by switching the protocol to the newer version that offers header compression and uh, most of all, uh, better connections multiplexing. So let's look at the simple demo I have found in the internet. And these are the two pictures that are loaded from the same server uh, from multiple tiles. Each tile was loaded in a separate request from the same server. The left side was loaded using HTTP 1.1, the right side was uh, loaded using HTTP 2 from the same server. So here the difference was magnificent. It is like five times faster on HTTP 2 just by switching the protocol version thanks to that much better connections multiplexing. Uh, the reality is not every website is a jigsaw puzzle. So in my case, I've switched to HTTP 2 and my results was not that good. Uh, but still, I was able to shave off like 3% of my uh, load time, so uh, as it was quite cheap for me and have no uh, side effects, why not? This is still a performance gain. And with HTTP2, there comes another possibility uh, with server push. Server push is a mechanism that allows uh, cl client and server that are both uh, push enabled to interact in a kind of a new way. So whenever the push enabled client asks for uh, the first resource, for example, index HTML, and uh, the server knows that whenever something is asking for index.html, it's uh, very likely that the same client will uh, in a moment ask for JavaScript and style sheets for the same website. So it just pushes it together with a response for index uh, HTML. So when the client actually asks for that resources, it already has it uh, available in the local cache. So we eliminated the need for two uh, HTTP requests to have it just in one. Th that sounds great, but the problem is that uh, the support in the browsers is kind of inconsistent still, and it's not trivial to implement it on the server side. And not even not, not all the major uh, server side technologies are fully embracing it yet. Uh, but we can use a bit simpler alternative that uh, does a bit uh, similar thing, and it's quite uh, easier. These things are called preload and prefetch. Preload is a simple thing that we can add to the link, to the head section of our HTML. This is just a link tag that tells our browser we are going to need some resources soon. So it is not yet needed by the website being loaded, but it will be needed soon. This is especially useful for web fonts that are normally only discovered quite late in the process of uh, loading the website, uh, after the CSS is uh, parsed and executed. O only then the font download starts normally. But if we add that font uh, to the preload section, the browser knows it can start downloading it, downloading it much sooner, much faster. Uh, much earlier, actually. And the second thing is prefetch. Uh, it is also a link uh, element that we can add to head section. It is useful if we have a um, page that we can guess where the user will navigate next. So some kind of stepped wizards process uh, or um, that kind of thing. Uh, we can ask the browser to already have the HTML for the next navigation in place, prefetched before the user actually navigates there. Um, again, a simple link element. Mm, I have added preload for my web fonts. I am using two fonts here. One is for icons, the second one is just for text. So just by adding those two lines of, uh, of HTML to my head section, my metrics, my first meaningful paint metric went down by one and a half second. So it was uh, kind of a good progress for just two lines of HTML. My first paint increased a bit. We will work on that a bit later. There are other kinds of preload-like uh, techniques available in some circumstances that we might, we might consider using 
in our scenarios, in our projects. First is DNS prefetch. If we um, download the data from a uh, different origin, from a different server, from a different domain um, in, in our um, runtime, then it makes sense to uh, save on the DNS uh, prefetching, uh, on the DNS resolving uh, time um, upfront just by uh, asking the browser to do it earlier. We can even establish a TCP connection upfront before it is actually needed with pre-connect. And in some browsers, we can even ask for pre-rendering. So if we know where the user will navigate next, again, we can uh, add a pre-render tag that asks the browser to not only download the content, but also render it in a hidden frame so that when the user actually navigates there, it is just swapped into a view uh, immediately. So it looks like it was uh, just loaded from the cache or uh, it was already there. Mm. Next, content delivery networks, CDNs, are still a very, mm, very important thing if we uh, think about performance, uh, about network performance. Mm. This is a typical breakdown of the mm, front-end application uh, request from Chrome DevTools. So it's not the content download that takes the most time. It's actually waiting. TTFB is time to first byte. So it includes the server-side processing time, but that should not really matter in the front-end applications that are mostly uh, static JavaScripts and, uh, and CSS uh, served from the server. This time is mostly spent on networking. So all the routing, all, all the DNS uh, resolving, all the uh, TLS handshakes and so on. This is included in that green bar. So definitely uh, we should optimize for it. And what CDNs offer us is to place uh, uh, copies of our websites uh, ge geographically uh, distributed so that our users are downloading our content from as close uh, to them as possible. So if we happen to have a distributed user base or if we have hosting in states, for example, uh, definitely content delivery networks are uh, must have for us. And it can offer uh, an improvement in that networking time by an order of magnitude. But there are even simpler things that are still crucial for the performance and we uh, sometimes uh, forget about it. Plain old headers, plain old HTTP headers. We should always remember that all our immutable content should be always served with long expiration dates using cache control headers. And all our immutable content should be served with cache control no cache. That doesn't mean not to cache. It means that the browser will cache the data, but whenever it is to be used, it will ask the server to revalidate. So if the uh, version the client already has is still valid or not. So we are still able to uh, save a few kilobytes of, uh, for the transfer and a few milliseconds for the transfer. We can now even go further with service workers that are available in almost all the browsers right now. Uh, with service workers that are an intermediate layer between uh, our applications working in the browser tab and the network, uh, within the service worker, we can cache our resources up front on the installation phase. So we can actually decouple from the network. Uh, so for subsequent load, uh, we don't even need the network at all in, uh, if, if we uh, serve the content from the cache first. Mm, I used both. So um, uh, this is obviously valid only for subsequent visits because all the caching scenarios make sense only if the user already has an opportunity to, to cache it. But with cache headers, my website loaded in less than three seconds. And with service workers that eliminate the need for networking, it was less than a second. So obviously, our loyal users will be very grateful for that kind of improvements. But we need to optimize the general scenario too. So let's go further. Now to the client side. So our content gets, uh, went through the network. We have it in the browser. We need to think what happens there. What are the processes that the browser does uh, to display the website on the user's screen. Um, this is called critical rendering path, so the order in which the browser processes things. It is in most cases uh, drawn in that kind of waterfall timing chart that you might be familiar from Chrome DevTools or tools like uh, webpagetest.org. Um, so let's think about the um, rendering process, so putting things on the user's screen. Mm, the process of uh, displaying the DOM tree on the screen. How do you think? When the renderer can work? Can it work all the time without any interruptions, regardless of what is being downloaded? No. 
it can only work until the first CSS is discovered. When the CSS is discovered, the rendering stops and it can only be resumed after that CSS is downloaded and executed. So observation number one, CSS blocks rendering. Why is that? This is because browsers are trying to uh, optimize, trying to avoid flickering and trying to avoid repainting everything on the screen. So when there's a CSS in flights, the browser are uh, assuming that uh, the view will change. So it makes no sense to draw anything, it just waits until the CSS is there. Now scripting. How do you think when that nasty add.js can be executed? Can it be executed imme immediately after it was uh, downloaded? No, it needs to wait for CSS too. Observation number two, CSS blocks scripting. That might be surprising, but this is because there is an API in the, uh, in the DOM called uh, get computed uh, styles that allows us to get the computed uh, style rules for a given element. So in order for the browser to respond deterministically, it needs to know the CSS. So it looks like CSS is kind of important for, for the performance, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, now let's, look, let's go even deeper. So for the most basic process that happens in our browser, and that is parsing. Parsing, so this is a process of translating an incoming HTML stream into a DOM tree. Is there something that might stop that basic process in the browser? Obviously there is. It is stopped whenever a JavaScript is encountered. Uh, so no parsing can happen when the JavaScript is being downloaded, but not only downloaded, it can only be resumed after it was actually executed. So it can only be resumed far on the right. The most basic process is stopped for such a long time. So observation number three, JavaScript download blocks parsing. Why is that? This is because of a legacy of the web. We have an API called document.write that is defined to modify the DOM tree being built exactly in place and in time it was encountered. So the browser uh, can't know if we are going to shoot in our foot and use document.write. So it needs to assume we are going to do that and wait to see, wait, to, wait uh, uh, until everything is uh, available to allow document.write to work. Unless we tell the browser we are not going to do that because nobody's using document.write any, anymore. So uh, we can mark our JavaScript as asynchronous. If we mark it as asynchronous, we are telling the browser, that's fine, you don't need to wait. And then all the, that parsing can happen during that uh, download part. This is made just by adding an async attribute to the script element. Uh, it makes that hole in the parsing much, much uh, smaller. The hole here is for the uh, execution. Observation number four, four, JavaScript execution blocks parsing. Why is that? This is because how the web is designed. Again, maybe a, a bit of legacy, but generally parser and JavaScript uh, execution happens in the same thread. So by its nature, they need to share. Uh, when the JavaScript is executed, no parsing can happen. Uh, this might be a bit unfortunate because we are, again, stopping the most crucial process in our browser for ads to display. And uh, we don't necessarily, necessarily need, uh, want to have it. So we can tell the browser we are not need that JavaScript to be ex executed immediately. We are fine with waiting a bit uh, with a defer attribute. If we defer the execution of JavaScript, then it will be executed uh, not immediately when it is available for execution, but after the parsing is finished. So then we have an interrupted parsing, and it's, uh, it's uh, much less probable that the user will be affected. Again, it's a simple defer attribute that we can add to our script. Let's now look at the two videos of the same website that I have borrowed from uh, Google I.O. talk from last year about uh, performance metrics. Mm. The la left one is loading uh, partially, and the right one is loading immediately as completed. It was a bit faster, but how do you think? Which of these two experiences people tend to choose? The left one or the right one? Right one? Actually, people tend to, tend to uh, prefer the left one, because uh, it looks like it is doing something for them uh, from the very beginning. The right one is blank until it's done, so if the loading takes too long, it looks like broken, and people are more likely to abandon waiting. So it should be our goal to display anything. It might be just a header and a loading indicator as soon as possible, so that uh, people are uh, not uh, thinking uh, we are down. 
Um, how can we achieve it? How can we uh, do that? We should inline all the CSS that is needed to display that header and loading indicator directly into HTML um, so that no, C no blocking CSS request is needed to display it. So we are able to display it almost immediately. Uh, then we should ensure that nothing blocks our HTML streaming. So no blocking JavaScript is before that HTML elements responsible for headers. And uh, no blocking CSS is there. Mm, and all the rest should be pushed to the bottom. After the uh, top is rendered, then we can care about uh, dynamically loading the CSS and JavaScript for the rest of the website. This might not be easy, for the, especially for the existing website. But it's worth it, especially if you are starting something from the scratch. But it's not the only problem. This is also a problem. We have a website obesity crisis. Right now, uh, the statistics uh, say that the average um, size of a single website, single uh, view of a website, is about three megabytes. So we are asking our users to download three megabytes of content just to display a single screen. Half megabyte of it is just for scripts. So half megabyte of code is executed in uh, the browser just to display a single article. Uh, website obesity crisis is also a title of a great talk by Maciej Cegowski. I really recommend you to watch it. Uh, it, this is an eye-opener in this case, and it's very, uh, very well done. Uh, all the, uh, the slides will be available uh, for you, so don't bother checking it right now, obviously. Um, there is also a tool called Bundlephobia that estimates what is the cost of adding a package to our front-end bundle. So, for example, um, by adding Lodash, a very popular utility uh, in the web, just by adding its full um, package, we are increasing download time over 3G by half of a second. By adding jQuery, it's, it is 0 0.6 second. And uh, for React DOM, which is a bigger part of React, it is uh, three quarters of a second. And obviously, frameworks and libraries have its place, and uh, they have a lot of uses. But we have to remember that nothing comes for free. And in case of JavaScript, uh, it is not only the load time that matters. It's also parsing time, compilation time, and execution time that was not included in that previous uh, estimate. And that might sound like not that important, but if this is a half megabyte of code, then it is important. So for example, React, that is uh, relatively lightweight as a framework, on iPhone 5S, that was definitely a good phone, that yellow part only takes more than 100 milliseconds. So this is definitely a problem for the larger libraries or uh, low-end devices, and we should remember about it. Mm, what can we do? Uh, we have a great tool bundled within, within and kind of a hidden within uh, Chrome DevTools that is extremely useful. It is called coverage, and this is like a test coverage, but it's execution coverage. So we can run it uh, on the website, and it highlights all the code, all the JavaScript code and CSS code that was uh, actually executed. And uh, otherwise, it marks the code that wasn't executed. And it turns out that we are not executing uh, large chunks of the code we are serving to our users. Uh, we, it, uh, I was guilty too uh, on the website, on, the, on what web can do. Uh, it turns out that I, uh, I was only using 5% of Bootstrap I was serving to the users. So um, there is one more link. There is a website called whatdoesmysitecost.com that estimates what, uh, what amount of money users are actually paying in their data plans for downloading uh, our website. So it's not only adding a time uh, not only, uh, we are not only asking for the time of our users, we are just asking for them to spend money on, s or some, on something we are not going to use at all. So it's, it's just offending. Mm, what can we do? We can tree shake. Tree shaking is a thing that is bundled, uh, that, that is available in uh, the modern bundlers. It is a um, code analysis based th uh, thing that can um, reduce the size of our bundles by removing the code that is not uh, referenced from our code. So uh, if the code is uh, structured correctly, uh, then it might not be included in the final bundle. We can code split, especially if we are on HTTP2. We should no longer care about reducing the number of requests that much anymore. Uh, we used to serve all our JavaScript in a single bundle, uh, regardless if the user is uh, using that or not. Uh, now we should more 
uh, split it into uh, uh, separate bundles, for example, for a single view, so that we are not asking our browser to download the JavaScript for our admin pages that they are not going to see. We should uh, download only this code that is needed at the given point and dynamically load uh, the rest, or not the rest, dynamically load uh, whatever is needed for the next view when the user navigates there. <clears throat> and third thing, very important, is about critical thinking and common sense. Do we really need everything in if we can, uh, in some cases, replace it with 10 lines of our own code? Do we really need to put uh, all those libraries, uh, all the stuff um, by default in? I don't think so. Um, as I said, I was guilty too. Uh, this is a very simple and straightforward website, actually. But I was serving... Uh, that amounts of CSS, 46 kilobytes uh, of CSS and uh, uh, almost 150 kilobytes of uh, JavaScript. So I spent two evenings on just removing the code that was highlighted as, no, as not used uh, in that uh, coverage tool. And uh, during those two evenings, I was able to remove three quarters of, the, of my CSS and half of my JavaScript without any single behavioral or visual change for the website. What was the result on the metric? It was amazing it went down by 26%. So definitely uh, it is an optimization, uh, the best optimization I had, just by removing the code that was useless anyway. Last but not least in this section is about images. Images constitute a big part of um, that request averages. It is drawn here in blue. Um, so it's more than a half that is uh, spent on images. So we should definitely optimize images. There are two simple rules. First, that we should always care about proper format and proper compression. So whenever we are serving uh, vector images, they should probably be SVGs. And if this is a picture, this is a raster image, then we should uh, care about uh, compression rates. And the second thing, as half of our users are on mobile, it makes no sense to serve them 5,000 pixels wide images because they will just uh, only pay for it and not have a real benefits from that uh, great quality. So we should ensure responsiveness of our images either via SRC set attribute or via picture element so that we are not serving useless data again. Okay, <clears throat> the last thing is in runtime. So our, our website uh, already loaded, it is already displayed and uh, all the scripts are executed. And now we, or our user expects smooth animations and uh, smooth interactions. And uh, similarly to um, critical rendering path in the load and render section, here we have a pixel pipeline that we need to understand in order to optimize it. Pixel pipeline is everything the browser needs to do, every single frame, to display that frame to the user. So it starts with uh, change in the CSS, for example, uh, driven by JavaScript or defined in, in HTML. And then the browser needs to uh, figure out what are the styles for the influenced element. So if we change a class for a given element, then the calculated styles for this element and all its uh, children needs to be recalculated in that style phase. Um, then the browser progresses to the layout phase. Layout is about geometry, so the position on the screen of each influenced element is calculated and uh, its size, its width and height. Only then the browser uh, can think about actual pixels and about actual drawing. So this is a paint phase where the browser fills the visual layers uh, of each element with actual pixels. And in the last phase, called composition, those visual layers are squashed together into a single view that is pushed to the GPU and uh, displayed to the user for uh, each and every frame. Speaking about frames, it is pretty well known that we should try to have 60 frames per second. So quick math, it means that our time window for preparing a single frame is about 16 milliseconds. So it's kind of narrow. Mm, and uh, how can we have uh, how, how can we do everything within 16 milliseconds every time? Well, we can't, most probably. Uh, especially that on a large website, a non-trivial uh, style change will cause a style recalculation phase that might take 100 milliseconds for sure. So we are immediately losing our 60 frames per second. What can we do? Can we somehow optimize it? Yes, the advice here is that we should be lazy. This is a generally good life hack anyway. Uh, we should try to avoid any work that is not necessary. Uh, there is a website called CSS Triggers that might help us here. 
it shows us what are the uh, changes, what are the processes required in the browser to run whenever we change a particular CSS property. So, for example, if we change height or left or any other positional uh, CSS property, all the browsers need to repeat all the phases because everything changed basically. So uh, after the style recalculation, the layout must happen because geometry have changed. Then the paint must happen because layout happened, and then the composition must happen. So we are not able to uh, optimize anything when, uh, when we have changed uh, sizes. But for example, if we are changing background color, some browsers are smart enough to figure out that backgrounds doesn't have anything with sizing of an element. So if we change uh, background, then there is no uh, sense to uh, recalculate the sizes uh, anymore. So we are one phase out. This is fine. And with transforms that are uh, rotation of, an, of elements, uh, res uh, res rescaling of elements, uh, and this kind of, this kind of effects, uh, trans transforms in some browsers are optimized away to the uh, composition phase. So uh, it is not that the actual element is uh, transformed, but it's only its visual layer on the GPU level is transformed. And on the GPU, it is just a, a matrices math uh, applied there, and this is quite fast because this is what GPU uh, does the best. So uh, in the case of transforms, we have no layout phase and no paint phase in some browsers. It's the same with opacities. Opacities can be reduced to just a matrices calculation on the GPU level. So how do you think? If we are animating something, which of these properties are uh, sh sh should we use? Obviously the ones that are the easiest to apply. So transforms and opacities. Uh, fortunately, all our tra traditional uh, position-based animations can be uh, replaced with transformations with some maths and some thinking that we should generally try to have. Uh, one thing to mention here is that by default, not all the elements are having its own visual layers. I have mentioned visual layers several, time, several times already. Uh, because browsers need to optimize for the memory usage too. Uh, and actually by default, all the elements go into a single uh, visual layer by default. So if, if we are starting transformation on an element that, has, uh, that is on the same visual layer than other elements, uh, we have no optimization because the browser starts with taking that element out of this visual layer first and uh, we are losing all the benefits from the optimizations. Uh, and as a developers, we don't have much control over visual layers except this trick with CSS property called will change. If we define our element uh, in CSS and, and tell that it will change, it will be animated with transforms, then the, we are proactively telling the browser please reserve a separate visual layer for these elements. So then, um, when we are starting animations on that, uh, uh, those elements are already ready for that uh, animation. Okay, now scrolling. Scrolling is hard, full stop. Even libraries that try to make it right have problems with this. This was recorded on the desktop device, so it was smooth, it was fine, everything was okay. Now, the same animation recorded on Samsung S8, which is a decent phone, definitely uh, um, higher end, and exactly the same website with the demo. So this is not a magic at all. Why is that? Well, they tried to do a position-based animation, so this is just hard. The, again, if you think back about the um, pixel pipeline, uh, doing that kind of changes on every single frame, because scroll events happen on every single frame. If we, on a, every single frame, so potentially every 16 milliseconds, we are changing uh, the positions and we are forcing layout phase, paint phase, and composi composition phase to repeat, then it is uh, very unlikely we are going to uh, fit into 16 milliseconds on mobile. So we just have to choose. Either we have that fancy parallax effects on scroll on mobile, or we have a decent uh, performance on mobile. There is no middle ground here, unfortunately. It's even worse with events that might that are the underlying events of scroll. So wheel events and touch events, the events that might uh, cause scrolling. Because those events um, are defined that they can cancel scrolling. So if we have a handler, JavaScript handler, registered to listen on that event, 
uh, then the browser needs to stop scrolling and wait for that handler to return to check if we are going to call prevent default there to uh, stop these animations. So we are uh, giving even that, that, that 16 millisecond uh, window even smaller for the browser, unless we optimize it away with passive uh, listeners. This is implemented in Chrome only, I believe, uh, right now. Uh, but it is telling the browser, we are not going to cancel the scroll, so go on, do your job. We are not going to shoot in our foot again. Two more goodies around request timing. First is request animation frame. It's a function that ensures uh, we are not going to execute the code wrapped into that uh, callback um, more often than we need. It is called exactly uh, once before the next rendering happens. So uh, if we uh, do some kind of um, calculations or uh, we are saving the um, positions of elements before rendering, it should be wrapped within a request animation frame so, we, so that we are not doing unnecessary work. Um, and the second thing is request idle callback. That um, is uh, useful if we have uh, JavaScript code that will take more than 16 milliseconds to execute. And obviously we have that pieces of code. For example, if we are parsing the responses from the server, it, uh, it most probably will take more. So if we, if we wrap it in request idle callback, we are asking the browser to wait until nothing important is happening in the browser. So no scrolling, no animation, so uh, it is less likely to interrupt what the user is doing at the moment. Okay, there were a lot of tips and tricks today, so instead of doing a full recap, let me just give you three things that you might apply to your uh, work tomorrow. First, it's about prioritizing performance, treating performance as a feature. In the native apps development, they treat performance as a feature because they develop on the actual devices. In the web world, we are not doing that uh, normally, and we should think about performance as something added, uh, an additional value. Um, but we should think like uh, the native developers are thinking, um, because there are a lot of statistics all over the internet that it translates into money. So whenever your manager asks you that it makes no sense uh, for performance optimization, performance optimizations right now, just grab these statistics and tell uh, him or her that it just translates into money for a business. Mm -hmm. Second thing is to look for easy wins. Not everything I have shown today uh, was extremely hard. Some of these things were actually kind of trivial, so like uh, preload uh, for fonts or async attribute. It was something that uh, in the project of any size, it should be available within days, if not hours. And the performance gains might be, gains might be really uh, significant. And the third mo most important thing is to ship less code. We should always think about that when adding something. We should really, um, we should really ensure that uh, the code we are adding gives more value than it costs. Do we really need to have jQuery in by default in 2018 if uh, we can replace uh, all that manipulations within 10 lines of uh, native DOM code? I don't think so. We can really do better. Okay, if you need a full recap, the slides are already available at slides.com slash adambar slash mobileweb perf. That's all from me. Thank you. I'm open for questions.